the 82nd started as an infantry division in World War I. Sergeant Alvin York was with the All-American Division. Also a major named Jonathan Wainwright, destined for greatness as a general in World War II. At war's end, the All-American Division was demobilized. It came alive again in 1942, when it was reactivated as an infantry division under General Omar Bradley. When General Matthew Ridgway took command later that year, the 82nd became the Army's first airborne division. From the start, airborne training was rugged. They ran and ran some more. They jumped and climbed and crawled. There were calisthenics, rifle range, shoot school, glider loading, practice jumps, crash landings. The training was continuous from Fort Benning, Georgia to the sands of North Africa. The men of the 82nd were learning what it meant to be really combat ready. And ready they were when the first mission was announced in July 1943. Blowing up clouds of desert dust, they took off from North Africa and headed out over the Blue Ocean. Ahead was their first combat jump. They were to drop into Sicily behind enemy lines, ahead of an Allied invasion that was coming in by sea. The men of the 82nd advanced 150 miles in six days. The German and Italian defenders were routed but not without hard fighting. The Sicilian campaign was the first combat proof that American airborne doctrine was valid. And the fighting quality of its paratroopers was made dramatically clear. The next jump came soon afterward. The Allies had landed at Salerno on the Italian mainland, but the bridgehead was in trouble, so the 82nd went in. The Germans, some of Hitler's best troops, fought savagely with everything they had. It wasn't enough. They were beaten back. On October 1st, 1943, Naples was liberated. Men of the 82nd led the way in, but they had little time for the victory celebration, as elements of the division fought at the Anzio beachhead. They pursued the Germans into the Apennine Mountains. They had to fight mud and exhaustion as well as rocky heights. Spearheading the 5th Army's advance, they finally joined the British 8th Army at Mount Simucro. Then the 82nd was relieved and sent to England. This was their first real breathing spell since Sicily. No one really believed it would last for long, but it was nice while it lasted. Replacements began pouring in and intensive training was resumed. jump of all was coming up, into France, to smash the walls of Hitler's fortress Europe. Once again, they were going in ahead of the ground forces. The 82nd Airborne, the new 101st American Airborne, and the British 6th Airborne. The German army was taken by surprise, but not completely. The 82nd Airborne Division will land to the immediate west of the 101st for the purpose of preventing the movement of enemy reserves to the east and north. The Festung Europa, walled in by the formidable defense in depth of the Atlantic Wall. Mined, trapped, bristling with gun emplacements and fortifications. An 
impregnable barrier, said the Nazis. The combined chiefs of staff decided that frontal assault alone would not crack Fortress Europe. The Atlantic Wall must be vaulted and the cracking process begun from the rear. The initial effort by land, sea and air would be made in this area, spearheaded by troop carrier and airborne forces. But before the D-Day, there must be a number of lesser D-Days. The first large-scale airborne operation was performed in conjunction with the assault on Sicily, 10 July 1943. Taking off from fields in Africa for dropping zones in Sicily, troop carrier units transported by glider and aircraft, units of the 1st British and the U.S. 82nd Airborne Divisions. Almost a year before this operation, a troop carrier group transported a parachute infantry battalion from England to start the invasion of North Africa. But the invasion of Sicily was the first real test for troop carrier units, which had trained in maneuvers in Texas, the Carolinas, and England. The Sicilian operation indicated there was much to be learned about the planning of an airborne operation. Troop carrier aircraft were shot down by friendly forces, and parachute drops were widely scattered. It was a tactical success, however, rich in experience for the units which would later participate in the assault on the continent. The lesson was driven home that more navigation aids were badly needed, that gliders must be landed at slow speeds, that some type of air brake was necessary to decrease the rate of descent of gliders going into small fields, that protection for the nose of the glider in rough landing should be provided, not only to protect the pilot, but to facilitate unloading. A technique had to be worked out for gliders landing on water. of Sicily was added the experience of the highly successful operation in the Markham Valley of New Guinea, in which troop carrier and airborne forces showed the practicability of a well-planned daylight operation. In the United States, many lessons learned from the operations in Sicily, Markham Valley, and Salerno were made a part of training and maneuvers. The Griswold nose was developed to protect the glider in rough landings. The parachute arrestor was adopted to permit landing the glider in restricted areas. The intercom between tow plane and glider was introduced. Blitz landings were out. Glider pilots were taught a slow, constant rate of descent, with a slow landing to a precise spot on the ground. Many types of combat aircraft were suitable for towing the CG-4A glider. The B-25 was used. The P-38 performed its task well. And even the PBY became a tow plane. takeoff of the PBY before the glider. Here's a B-17 in dual tow. And a triple tow by a C-54.
Airborne aviation engineers trained in anticipation of their probable use for building landing strips and rebuilding bombed airdromes in France. Troop carrier airplanes are converted in a matter of minutes into ambulance ships. And from lessons learned overseas, grew the doctrine expressed in War Department Circular 113, employment of airborne and troop carrier forces. Doctrine was put into practice, and Circular 113 became the blueprint for all future airborne operations. Airborne and troop carrier units are theater of operation forces. Their employment must be an integral part of the basic plan made by the agency directing all land, sea, and air forces in the operation. The coordinating directive must be issued in time to allow realistic preparation and training by troop carrier and airborne units for the specific operation. Airborne troops must be employed in mass and the bulk of the force landed in as small an area as possible. The use of highly trained pathfinder teams dropped in advance to mark dropping zones and glider landing zones is essential. Procedures must be prescribed which will ensure that troop carrier aircraft on course at proper altitudes and on correct time schedules are not fired upon by friendly forces. and the staffs of operational training groups which were committed to the United Kingdom were trained in flying procedures of the United Kingdom before they left the States. emphasized, designed to prevent early detection by the enemy. Air crews had to fly through a corridor of flak, pinpointed by searchlights. Every aspect of operations in the United Kingdom, flying control, air sea rescue, supply, British navigation, weather, all phases of theater training were covered before the units departed overseas.
and their specialized tactics. Glider pilots are trained to stay in action with them until evacuated. Supreme Headquarters was formed. The planning phase changed to the manning phase. The Airborne Planning Committee, headed by the Air Commander-in-Chief of the Allied Expeditionary Air Force, was composed of representatives from all the services involved in the airborne operation. Navy, ground, and air, as well as the Troop Carrier Command and the Airborne Division's concerned. British ground crews helped assemble their own horse gliders before turning them over to Troop Carrier. This British horse now belongs to the 9th Troop Carrier Command. Each group now had 73 aircraft instead of the normal 52. The Troop Carrier Force of three wings and 14 groups contained one experienced wing and five combat-wise groups from the Mediterranean. Three planes in each squadron are equipped for aerial pickup. between ground and air is necessary for accuracy in delivery of resupply containers. men are pathfinders, a combined team of troop carrier crews and parachute technicians who will drop on objective areas and set up homing devices for the main aerial convoy. Teams consist of 9 to 14 technical men and 5 security personnel. The Pathfinder School, starting without precedent and table of organization and with little equipment, turned out 50 trained troop carrier crews and 260 British and American airborne officers and men by D-Day. Pathfinder airplanes were equipped with every navigational aid used by troop carrier. And the flight crews and airborne teams received 30 to 60 hours training in their use, both in the air and on the ground. Each Pathfinder team is equipped with eight specially designed holophane lights from which DZ light tees are made. By D-Day, crews who had lived, trained, and were briefed together could navigate under instrument conditions to within 600 to 800 yards of a pinpointed position in unfamiliar territory. From March through May, 35 lower echelon and three full-scale command exercises were held, culminating in a full-dress rehearsal for the operation against the continent. The times, loads, distances, and navigational aids were exactly as would be used in the assault. Landing zones were selected for their similarity to those in Normandy, which intelligence showed were 900 to 1,500 feet long and averaged 500 feet wide. Mosaics showed that the objective areas would hold 1,300 gliders. The Normandy fields were bounded by trees 15 to 75 feet high, along with numerous dense hedges. Glider pilots were allowed to choose their own fields, and release was made at heights from 800 to 1,000 feet.
Both ideas were impractical. The high release made the gliders more vulnerable to ground fire and sacrificed accuracy. And when each pilot chose his landing field, there were too many conflicting patterns. Following this maneuver, it was decided that leaders were to choose the landing field for the three other gliders in his element. And the release would be made at 400 to 600 feet. small enough for practical operational training are used, there are certain to be crack-ups. A compromise must be made between realistic training and the number of gliders which may be expended on the maneuver. One reason the percentage of horse crack-ups was to be so much higher in the actual operation was that a sufficient number were not available for extensive practice in full load landings into small fields. Because of their rugged fuselage construction, most of the CG-4A gliders, which sustain damage upon landing, deliver their loads of personnel and equipment in fighting condition. Infantry file into buses for their last landborne ride until D Day. until they climb aboard the airplanes and gliders. New equipment is issued. a few moments to read letters from home and write a few lines. But this is business, and you want to be sure you're in business when the time comes. So you take inventory of your stock and trade and keep everything clean and shining and ready. Overnight, the ships blossomed out in their new war paint. On D-2, Invasion markings were applied. Another lesson from Sicily. Invasion money revealed the objective. By now, the high command insisted that individuals should know their destination. Before takeoff time, parapacks were assembled and delivered to the C 47s. L.A. 
LSTs receive their quotas of troops who will cross the beaches and move forward if troop carrier and airborne have done their job. One glider regiment of the 101st was to go in by boat, as were some attached and supporting units of both divisions. The lift, or the required aircraft and gliders, was not available to put them in by air as early as needed. D-Day minus one, and time narrows down. Gliders for the first night's operation are assembled for the takeoff. Glider pilots are told to assemble at division headquarters after landing for evacuation to England. An airborne general has a final talk with his men. Troop carrier and airborne have their final inspection. More than a dozen fields, paratroopers march their ships. Each pilot has been furnished a list of his passengers. Parapacks are checked. This outfit has enough of Pash blood in its collective veins to justify their haircut. There is a message from the Supreme Commander. You are about to embark on a great crusade. The eyes of the world are upon you, and the hopes and prayers of all liberty-loving people go with you.
Pilot and crew chief, make a final check of the parapax. And here's another final check. This time by the jump master, just before the men go aboard. This trooper will drop his British leg pack loaded with demolition supplies just before he lands. Dusk. Pathfinder teams board the ships that will show the way into enemy territory. One hundred twenty-five troop-laden aircraft will home tonight on navigation aids set up by these pathfinders. This is one minute out of one hour in one day in the world's history that has rarely been equaled. These are the first ships to take off in the airborne invasion of Fortress Europe. The first Pathfinder ship is airborne at 2154. As the Pathfinders head for the coast of France, other C-47s move into position for their takeoff at the head of the runway. minutes after the Pathfinders take off, the first serials of C-47s follow on the invasion path. carrier aircraft cross the channel, the Allied invasion fleet has already weighed anchor. Sealing had been forecast as 3,000 en route, clearing at DZ, but actually is variable, 500 to 1,000. Visibility is poor. Stand up. Hook up.
unit landed squarely on the German 91st Infantry Division and other enemy troops. These enemy units were on maneuvers and were already occupying their assigned defensive positions. Surprise was gained only by the leading parachute unit, and subsequent serials found themselves under practically continuous ground and anti-aircraft fire while crossing the peninsula and upon landing. 821 airplane loads, 13,000 paratroops were delivered into DZs in less than two hours. Troop carrier had not planned or trained for a night glider landing, but more panzers moving into the peninsula made 100 glider loads of anti-tank guns and troops essential for the initial phases. It was estimated that only 50% of personnel and equipment would be available for use after the landing. This calculated risk was accepted. The serials were made up of the reliable CG4As, which were easier to put into strange fields in darkness. Zero, 0200. Time for the gliders to go. Defenses are softened up for the beach landings. Daybreak. The naval bombardment continues. troops to blast enemy coastal installations. Priority number one, air supremacy, had been obtained a long time before D-Day. The 8th and 9th Air Forces had accomplished that. Standing offshore, the invasion craft wait as Allied planes blast the coast. surface ships come in. phase, the bombing and crippling of roads, bridges, waterways, railheads, the isolation of a battlefield, and the battlefield is isolated. No German reserves come through to the coast in any strength. The beachhead holds and grows as the Air Force piles up a record number of sorties. blast every target that moves on enemy ground. Any target of opportunity is legitimate prey. Record sorties are flown by the fighters on D-Day.
Back in England, the next glider serials are being marshaled for the takeoff. The C-47s are doing double duty. Back from the paratroop drops, they're ready to take off with gliders. Dual tow had been practiced in the States, but it was not used in this operation due to the extra time necessary for air assembly and to the additional marshalling space which it would require on the airdromes. Hard-pressed paratroopers who went into action in darkness earlier today are depending on reinforcements and heavier equipment, which will be delivered by these glider serials. Three groups of fighter cover are in takeoff position at airdromes to the south. coordinated British effort was made simultaneously by the British 6th Airborne Division, transported by RAF 38 Group on objectives around Calm. Particularly interesting was the delivery of eight and one half ton tanks of a recce regiment in 30 huge Hamilcar gliders. 29 of the 30 tanks were in action within 10 minutes after they were landed. Air superiority makes possible this daylight operation. ACAC ended a mission for this friendly airplane. Two-way traffic, and it's congested. These are areas flooded by the Germans. Parachutes and gliders from the previous serials. The gliders cut loose from their tow planes. We have fighter cover all the way to the landing zone. Not even a lone German fighter was able to sneak through.
of the gliders makes a landing in the flooded area. Here are the staked fields intelligence warned us about. The traps consisted of poles 12 to 15 feet long. First Airborne Divisions were in action 33 and 24 days respectively. The 82nd, having captured Salmere Glis and secured the bridgehead across the Mer de Ray River, destroyed other river crossings, protected the flank of the 7th Army Corps, and drove west to the Douve River. The 101st seized the areas assigned it, destroyed bridges, and drove on to Carentan to establish a defense area there. Troop carrier, the commanding general of the 82nd Airborne Division sent this commendation. Under most difficult conditions, including landing under fire in enemy occupied terrain, glider pilots did a splendid job. On the ground, they rendered most willing and effective service, providing local protection for the division command post during the most critical period when the division was under heavy attack from three sides. Please express to all elements of your command who brought the division in by glider or parachute, or who performed resupply missions for us, our admiration for their coolness under fire, their determination to overcome all obstacles, and for their magnificent spirit of cooperation. This is part of the price paid for 6 and 7, June 1944. Sixteen hundred sixty-two troop carrier airplanes were dispatched in the first 24 hours of the assault. Forty-three were lost and 311 damaged by small arms fire. A lot happened here that cameras could never get. But a corporal with the Pathfinders remembers. We were covering the landing of the first bunch of gliders. We were pinned down by German fire across the field. As the men came running out, they stepped right into it and started to drop all around us. A German cannon blew one glider right apart. A veteran glider pilot. A night glider operation means more landing casualties and extreme difficulty in unloading. It is certainly not desirable if a dawn or dusk landing is at all practicable. A power pilot. I flew in a parachute serial the first night and the navigation aids really worked but I couldn't see the light T, which was supposed to be on my drop zone. A War Department observer who entered combat with one of the airborne divisions. Troops were dropped generally in the vicinity of the DZs, but were badly scattered. It appears that prearranged supply systems are not flexible enough for airborne combat. Supplies should be dropped as called for by local commanders rather than dropped in mass. Large-scale parachute resupply drops are wasteful and should be restricted to emergencies. More attention should be paid to switching over to ground supply as soon as possible. A troop carrier liaison officer. Our Pathfinder teams, in two cases I know of, suffered heavy casualties. The light tees, which we expected so much help from, were only 10% operational due to enemy fire. 50% of the resupply drop landed in enemy hands. Communications didn't exist to advise later serials of changes in the enemy situation. Troop carrier operations and communications personnel should move with the first parachute or glider units. 
89% of the horses and 50% of the wackos crashed in landing. But 75% of personnel and equipment were ready for combat. The key point in the Nazi defenses and the first town to be liberated in France. It was a slow process. They had to bleed for every town, field, and hedgerow. The 82nd fought for 33 days without relief or reinforcements. The enemy wished they hadn't. Of the 13,000 men who jumped into Normandy, only 5,000 were still on their feet when the 82nd was sent back to England to rest and rebuild the outfit. Almost as bad an ordeal was the Battle of the Bulge when Hitler's panzer divisions cracked the Allied line in Belgium. The 82nd was called on to hold the northern shoulder of the bulge. Not only were they outgunned and outnumbered, they were freezing. Like their fellow paratroopers of the 101st at Bastogne, the men of the 82nd threw back one desperate attack after another. Finally, the Nazi drive was played out. soldiers stayed on the ground now to race across Germany, scooping up a fantastic number of prisoners, including the entire 21st German Army, 145,000 men. It was an inglorious end to Hitler's dream of a thousand-year Reich.